Okay, so check this out. Rumble in the Bronx is the greatest movie of all time, and anyone who says differently is either dead inside or confusing it with Rush Hour. It's a giant ball of insane action scenes from the absolute peak of Jackie Chan's career, strung together by a ridiculous plot involving a woman he's just met to whom Jackie enslaves himself for no apparent reason, some pasty diamond thieves that come out of nowhere halfway through the movie, and a street gang so ethnically diverse it would make a stock photographer weep. There's dialogue apparently written by an EFL student. What about the last time they threw a grenade to the crowd? The street gang rides doom buggies, and there's a f***ing tiger in a nightclub. It's completely nonsensical, the action is relentless, and it was the best time you could have in a movie theater in 1995. In this video, I will endeavor to teach you some things you don't already know about how it all came to be. But before we do, let's get back to this nightclub for a second. There are so many things wrong with this. First, this band is clearly not playing this music. Second, this is not how people dance to whatever this band actually is playing. Third, this band has a saxophone player for some reason. And finally, although only tangentially related, there is apparently only one band in New York City, because these are the same guys playing days later in the middle of the street during the hovercraft chase. Hovercraft! Which actually suggests a deeper mystery. Maybe they weren't supposed to be in that nightclub at all. Maybe they just roamed the streets of New York City, setting up and bringing their unique brand of jazz metal fusion to the masses, whether they want it or not. But whatever, let's do this thing. Number one. Rumble was Jackie's fifth attempt to break into Hollywood. By 1978, Jackie was a bona fide superstar in Asia, and in 1980, he got his first Hollywood starring role in Battle Creek Brawl, directed by Robert Klaus, a hack who directed a whole slew of terrible C-grade action movies, and for some reason, Enter the Dragon. Unfortunately, Jackie spoke little English, and Klaus clearly didn't have any interest in utilizing Jackie's talent. He spends most of the movie fighting elderly diabetics who don't move all that well, and impersonating Bruce Lee. Jackie even advised Klaus at one point that for a fight scene on roller skates, given a few days to practice, he could learn to do a backflip on the skates. His request was denied. I mean, can you imagine? You're a director, and Jackie Chan comes to you and says, Hey bro, if you give me a minute, I can totally do a backflip on roller skates in your movie. And you're like, no. Not surprisingly, the movie sucks and no one paid it any attention. In 1981, he had a small role in Cannonball Run, directed by Hal Needham. And although that movie was a huge success and even generated a sequel, audiences were not clamoring to see more of that little guy in the Mitsubishi who doesn't speak English. Then in 1985, he starred in The Protector, in which the single coolest thing he does is jump over this fence. It wasn't until 1995 that he tried again. This time, he shot his own movie, his own way, for his own audience. But he set it in New York City and scripted a lot of the dialogue in English, so it would be more palatable to an American audience. He struck a distribution deal with New Line Cinema, and it was given a wide US release in 1995, where it was number one on opening weekend and took in $32 million. Then, he dropped the mic and banged Robert Klaus's wife. He banged her right in the palm of her hand, because high fives are a traditional way of expressing joy, and they had become friends. Number two, he wasn't the only one who jumped that alley. Rumble was directed by Stanley Tong, an accomplished stuntman in his own right. Stanley has a rule that he never asks an actor to perform a stunt that he wouldn't do himself. So in a lot of his movies, he performs the big stunts first, because reasons. For example, he broke his ankle while filming Supercop by performing this helicopter fall before the stuntman did. This obviously makes no sense at all, and I'm pretty sure he just wants an excuse to do some cool stunts and earn some bragging rights. But either way, your boy jumped the alleyway before Jackie did. There is no public footage of this, so I'm sorry I can't show it to you, but apparently he wore a safety harness attached to wires and performed the jump Jet Li style. They decided it didn't look natural enough, and that because of the obstacles in the scene, including overhead power lines, the wire harness actually made it even more dangerous. So Jackie just went ahead and jumped at Raw Dog. Now, I should mention that I did find one source that claims that Jackie never did the stunt at all, and that the version in the movie is actually Stanley Tong. But I'm pretty sure this author is mainlining whatever drug it is that makes you lie and say stupid things, because this story makes no sense. And while this could technically be fake, everything about this footage looks to me like Jackie Chan doing some Jackie Chan sh**. But, you know, teach the controversy, I guess. Number three, Jackie is using a wheelchair by the end. After he broke his ankle, Jackie famously painted a sock to look like a shoe and wore it over his walking cast. Less famously, he also used a little scooter for some of the close-ups. I go to the hospital, put the cast on, going back to the set, I still shooting. Then the shot, I suppose I'm running. 
but how can I run? Then we put the wheelchair like this. <laughs> yeah, for the tie shot. Uh -huh. <laughs> somebody, somebody put the wheelchair. I just. <laughs> that's, that's how we make the movie. Number four, the outtakes were Hal Needham's idea. You probably know that one of Jackie's trademarks is a spectacular reel of outtakes at the end of his movies. But what you may not know is that those outtakes are only there because of Hal Needham, the aforementioned director of Cannonball Run. Hal was a legendary Hollywood stuntman who began directing movies in 1977 with Smokey and the Bandit. His second film was Hooper, a movie about an aging stuntman and his young rival. Hal staged so many huge stunts for Hooper that by the end of the movie he had a ton of extra footage that didn't make it into the film. Rather than just let it go to waste, Hal stuck it at the end of the movie next to the credits, and the outtake credit sequence was born. He liked the result so much that he used the same technique on every movie he made after that, including Cannonball Run. And when Jackie saw the end credits of his new movie Cannonball Run, he liked the outtake so much that he adopted the technique himself, starting with Dragon Lord in 1982. Jackie has used outtakes in almost every movie since, including Rumble in the Bronx. History, bitches. Hey, thanks for watching. Please click like and hit subscribe for more videos like this. If you know anything cool about Rumble in the Bronx that I didn't mention, then please let me know in the comments because I would like to know it too. And I'm very excited about a new show I have coming in January. I have enlisted some very talented people to help me with it, so I think it's going to be pretty good. So please definitely subscribe so you can see that in January. And it goes without saying that I am beyond excited for the new Star Wars, and if everything goes to plan, I'll have a quick and dirty review online by opening night. In the meantime, I post updates and random nonsense on Twitter and Instagram sometimes, but mostly it's just pictures of my cat. Later.